Bibles in the book of Genesis, in chapter number 32, we're going to look at one of the great stories of the Bible, and um, we're going to look at three lessons from a wrestling match, and um, our account tonight is of a wrestling match between Jacob and the angels. So Genesis chapter number 32 uh, from verse 24 down through verse number 32. And don't forget that next week starts our combined services. Please be praying for Brother Tony. He'll be with us next week. And be praying for him all week long. Be praying for yourself. And uh, I'm sure that God will have a, use him and have a blessing in store for us next Sunday uh, as we celebrate his birthday. And, uh, and he preaches to us. And so we'll have a good time in the Lord. But, yeah, just remember, don't show up at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights. And this is the last one for 2022. And uh, so when you find your place there in Genesis 32, we're going to read from verse 24 down through verse number 32. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Genesis 32, 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved." And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. And... Um, Let's, let's go to the Lord together and ask his blessing tonight. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we, we love you and we thank you tonight for being such a good God to us. And we thank you for the chance to be together once more on this Lord's Day. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would help us by your word. We thank you for the precious count here in Genesis 32 and how it's comforted saints for uh, millennia. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us as uh, we glean from this story one more time. I pray that you would feed our souls, help us understand uh, just uh, something about ourselves and something about the nature of God tonight, and help us to be determined wrestlers with God, that we would labor uh, with you in prayer and that uh, our very nature and our demeanor would be crafted and shaped and that we would uh, prevail with you. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. A lot of things in Scripture are out of order in the sense of the way that man does things. Uh, one of them is Jacob. Remember that he was not the firstborn child, but actually he was the secondborn child. And Esau, uh, by world standards, should have been the patriarch of that tribe and should have inherited his father's wealth and led that father's family in a spiritual blessing. But we see in Romans chapter number 9, God said, uh, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Uh, and it's very interesting, the story of Jacob here. Uh, Jacob, the surplanter, the heel catcher, uh, was not the mighty man that Esau was. He was the man of the tents, the smooth man, the pie-making mama's boy. Uh, you know, if I was God, I think I would have chose Esau, the mighty hunter, uh, as my guy, uh, and not Jacob and uh, the, as the great man, as the strong man. But God chooses the weakest. 
another instance of this is God chose the littlest son of Jesse. Again, not the firstborn, not the secondborn, not the thirdborn, not the fourthborn, not the fifthborn, sixthborn child, son, little ruddy guy uh, out there, little redhead uh, out there watching and tending sheep. Uh, God chose David to slay, slay great Goliath with his little sling. Picture uh, Moses, the mighty deliverer. His name means drawn out of the water. I mean, talk about a name full of meaning. Moses, uh, how did, you know, back in this day, drawn out of the water. Tell me the story about your name. Uh, well, uh, they found me in the Nile, and uh, they pulled me out of the Nile. I mean, good start there. Uh, how about a picture, a 80-year-old man, a sheep herder, all washed up, uh, really by mankind's standards, and here he went from being a prince in Egypt to having an abominable profession. I mean, he was worse than a trash collector. He was a sheep herder. He was on the backside of a desert at 80 years old, past his prime, uh, when God revealed himself to him in the burning bush. So God chooses the weakest. We see it again and again in the Bible. And um, God does not need strength, beauty, and talent, and power uh, in the way that the world needs it. In fact, uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, it says, not many mighty after the flesh are chosen. Uh, you know, I stand before you tonight, uh, and there are a lot of other people that are more talented, more capable, more able to serve God than I am. Uh, but God said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose a little uh, uh, bald-headed guy, you know, um, who never got good grades in school and uh, nobody ever thought would amount to much, and I'm going to choose him. Uh, well, there's people that are more sharp, more talented, more able, more capable, uh, but they're doing other things where God says, I've chosen the weak things of this world uh, to confound the wise. Uh, and so God uses and chooses the weakest. And God also chooses the weakness of the weakest. Uh, so picture, for instance, the Bible strong man, uh, mighty Sam Samson. Uh, so in all of his life and in all of his ministry, he has this great strength. Uh, but picture him right in his last and final hour, his last and final day, uh, eyes gouged out, being led about by a little boy. So remember, they had a little boy lead the mighty man of Israel around because he was so weak. And they tie him between two pillars there in the Philistine temple. And Samson slays more in his weakness than he ever did in his strength. Imagine Apostle Paul. The name Paul means small. Uh, God would use him to win a bunch of Gentiles. We're looking at a bunch of Gentiles here tonight. Uh, God would use the Apostle Paul, and not only was he small, he had weak eyes, most likely epilepsy, some sort of uh, inner ear infection, fainting smells, smells, spells. He might have had fainting smells too, I don't know. Uh, the fainting spells. Three times he asked for this thorn in the flesh to be removed. And uh, what did God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. And so God used the weakness of the weakest, the Apostle Paul. He used the weakness of this, this small man. Remember this in the Bible, that men's extremity is God's opportunity. So we see the fourth man in the fire. He had to be in the fire to see the fourth man revealed. Uh, we see uh, Daniel in a den of lions with the lion's mouth miraculously shut. Haman's gallows, Stephen's stoning. At the stoning of Stephen, he sees the Son of God. Uh, John uh, sees the revelation there in exile. I think that uh, John uh, most likely is a little bit of a picture of, of the church. Uh, and it's a little picture of the end time church. Uh, remember that uh, John leans on Jesus' breast and he is the one whom uh, Judas is revealed to. Who is it, Lord, that's going to betray thee? Uh, him whom I dip the sop in. It was John in his weakness, in his exile. He had this great revelation. Um, uh, Christian history also reveals this same thing. Uh, one of my favorite hymns. There is a fountain filled with blood. William Cowper, the great hymn writer, 
wrote that wonderful, beloved song that we'll be singing for hundreds of years yet to come, and he wrote that song in a sanitarium. And, uh, and here's a man who went through great uh, mental trauma. Uh, Mighty asked you this afternoon, we were at lunch, he says, if a person gets saved and they have, uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny how, how the world works, but if, if they have, how do you term, term it, ment, uh, mental difficulties or uh, a- anxiety or depression or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, does that go away? So, well, your brain's an organ. So if your organ, the brain, is sick, uh, it's still going to be sick after you get saved. Now, the fact is that the Lord will help you, like he did with William Cowper, uh, even in the midst of depression, even in the midst of a sanitarium where they're trying to help you in a, po- uh, a padded room. Uh, and a lot of the Christian friends, John Newton and others, helped William Cow- Cowper. I believe that uh, William Cowper actually lived with John Newton for a while and tried to help this man in his great mental distress, but the Lord was with him. How about Fanny Crosby, um, blind lady? And she wrote, uh, many, many beloved hymns. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, my wonderful redeemer. Someone came up to Fanny one time and said, Fanny, I so wish that God had given you your eyesight. Uh, and she said, don't wish that because his face will be the first that I shall see. And she went home and she wrote uh, that beloved hymn. Um, and, uh, and so God uses the weakness of the weakest God's, uh, God, man's extremity is God's opportunity. Uh, our youth director in Oklahoma, my basketball coach, good guy, um, and he, he was a young man, talented, athletic, and rebellious against God. Christian, but rebellious against God. Uh, diagnosed with leukemia in a hospital, young adult, doctor comes in and says, Tony, you're going to die. He says that that night, uh, he says that him and God had a wrestling match. All night long that night, he gave his heart to the Lord. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. We uh, read of other great men and great women of the faith, and we could look in their story, and we would see that God uses men like Jacob. Look at verse 24. Jacob was left alone. The biggest enemy that you and I will ever face is ourself. It's not the devil uh, and it's not uh, your spouse. Uh, It's not your boss. It's not the people that you are surrounded with. Uh, But Jacob was left alone. Nobody to talk to. It was just him alone with God. Remember Jacob's story here. Jacob came from a dysfunctional family dysfunctional family. In fact, look at Genesis chapter number 25 and verse number 22, is that Jacob, whole life was a wrestling match, not from his birth forward, but actually in utero. Inside the womb, Jacob was wrestling. He was in a wrestling match before he was even born. So if you look at uh, Genesis 25 and look at verse number 22, And it says, And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went in, uh, she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And so here he starts his life wrestling. Remember that he, uh, even his name means heel, uh, heel catcher, that Jacob held on to his brother's heel uh, as he was being born. And, uh, and for the rest of his life, he's going to be wrestling with everybody that is around him. Again, born into a dysfunctional family. Here, uh, Rebecca is going to be a deceiver, his mother, going to deceive his father. Uh, Now, uh, Isaac, the father, was rebellious against the will of God. I'm certain that if his wife, Rebecca, heard from God and he says, this is what God has revealed,
revealed unto me that inside my womb are two manners of people, two nations are inside my womb, uh, and the elder shall serve the younger. Undoubtedly, Isaac heard that and Isaac knew that. Uh, it was a family with uh, favorites. And so that always caused for dissension in the family. Um, in our family, Julie's favorite is all three of the children. I wasn't going to, she thought I was going to say Teddy. We won't tell anybody that. Um, that's not really. But Teddy is the baby, you know. Uh, but Isaac was, was, uh, was the one who loved Esau. He ate his meat and uh, was filled. And so key to a man's heart is his stomach. Why did he love uh, Esau? Is because he ate his meat. Uh, so dysfunctional family. Also, uh, he had a dirty uncle. Remember Uncle Laban? Uh, and so he's wrestling in his family. Uh, he's wrestling against mom. He's wrestling against dad. He's also going to wrestle against Laban. Uh, and uh, really, you know, takes one to know one. And the apple didn't far, fall far from the tree. I mean, it, Jacob had surplanting DNA that he was born with. And Uncle Laban uh, hoodwinked the used car salesman, Jacob. Uh, and if you remember that uh, struggle with the wives, uh, he gave them, uh, slipped them the ugly older sister and uh, I said ah you serve me for seven more years you can have the one that you love uh, and uh, had that struggling and wrestling match with uh, he had a deceitful wife who stole her dad's golden idols had a determined brother uh, who was going to kill him once he found him for swindling him of his birthright and stealing his blessing away from his father uh, and so this point in Jacob's life when he is left alone all he has seen trouble I have seen I mean his life was like a sad country song I mean there was sadness behind him uh, there was sadness right now uh, and then he was looking at future trouble I mean he was between the devil the devil and the deep blue sea he saw no way out of his problems. And really, he was put in a position there by God, uh, which was actually going to be to his own blessing uh, and also to his own changing of his, of his personhood and who he was. So this manipulator, the supplanter, the schemer, the worldly wise man. And oh, yeah, I was reading a little bit about Jacob today. Also, he had physical strength. Uh, one of the things that the Bible wants you to know when he, he removed uh, the large stone from the well, it wanted you to know that it was a large stone and Jacob by himself was able to move that large stone. Uh, and so he was used to getting things done uh, by the seat of his own britches uh, and he was used to this wrestling and he, he was used to this struggling. Here comes Esau with 400 men back there. Laban says, you do not cross this pillar. You stay on this side of the pillar, I'll stay on this side of the pillar and take good care of my wives, I'm out of here. Uh, and so he can't go back this way. Esau's coming with 400 soldiers. And so Jacob goes to the Lord in prayer. Look at Genesis 32, verse number 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac, the Lord uh, which said unto me, Return unto thy country and unto thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. And so here's how the patriarchs were revealed unto God. Um, I'm the God of thy father Abraham. I'm the God of thy father Isaac. And now I'm going to be your God. God did this with Abraham when he revealed himself in Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, you know, he revealed himself. And then with Isaac, I'm the God of thy father Abraham. And now I'm going to be your God. And then with Isaac, uh, now here's Jacob. And he says, I'm the God of thy father Abraham. I'm the God of thy father Isaac. Now I'm the God of thy father, uh, or you, Jacob. And from now on, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses in the burning bush. I'm the God of thy father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, so here, raised in a Christian home. How many were raised in a Christian home? All right. Uh, so when we, when we get saved, us in a Christian home, um, all of a sudden, our parents' behavior made sense. Not even get saved until I was 22. Uh, and then, man, I mean, the night I got saved, all of a sudden, you know, all, you know, all the 
radical behavior of my parents and all the people that are around. Oh, that's why. This is a living God. God could have came to me and said, I am the, the God of thy father, Tim, and the God of thy mother, Mary Ann, and now I am your God. And from this point forward, <laughs> I'm going back to God and saying, remember Bethel? Remember the house of God? Remember the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. And Jacob there at Bethel knew that the Lord was interested in him, uh, knew that God was involved in his life. He knew that God was in control and that God was directing him. And so here in this prayer, I want you to notice again, verse number nine of our chapter. He says, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will dwell with thee. Um, remember the Bible tells us, No man seeketh after God. They've all turned aside. They've all gone astray. And technically, when you get saved, it wasn't because you were seeking God. God sought you out. He came and found his lost sheep. He came and he, by the Holy Spirit, knocked on your heart's door. Uh, and you, praise the Lord, open up that heart door and let the Lord Jesus Christ come in. Uh, now, from this point forward, uh, you know, we've been given a new spirit. We've been given a new desire. Now I want you to notice that Jacob is now, God's not coming and knocking on Jacob's door. It's the opposite. Now he's going to God and reminding God of this relationship that he started back in Bethel. He's seeking after God. He is going to have a divine prayer appointment, and he is the one that is going to instigate this appointment as well. Uh, and so verse number 10, I am not worthy of the least of thy mercies, and all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant for with my staff I have passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for a multitude. He goes back to God and says, Whoa, I'm undone. I'm not worthy of your mercies, but you promise me, Lord. Do we have any promises in the Bible, Brother Styles? I think, Brother, don't you put that out on Facebook? Every, every day, every single day, uh, you Facebookers. Uh, friend, friend uh, Brother Styles, and you'll get something good in your feed okay counterbalance all the other stuff and uh and so he puts a bible promise each and every day and that's exactly what jacob is standing on standing on the promises i'm going to god in my prayer closet and i'm going to show god in his word uh remind him of what he exactly said to me and we're going to pray and so he goes into this prayer closet and um and he starts his wrestling match with the Lord. Look, if you will, to Hosea chapter number 12. So here the prophet Hosea, first six chapters or so, talks about his story uh, with his wife, his wife of whoredoms, an example of Ill, an illustration of Israel and how she has treated God. Uh, and, uh, and then from six on, there's much preaching and application going on there. And in Hosea chapter number 12, he encourages the children of Israel to follow their father, Jacob. It says, go and wrestle with the Lord God of Jacob. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Richard Phillips, pastor in Montrose, Michigan, for 40 years. And um, God, God places different... Uh, do you know him, Brother Stiles? Oh, man, I love that guy. I just... Uh, one of my favorite, sometimes God puts people in your life like right when you need them. Uh, and so I was interim pastor, 27 years old, uh, Landmark Baptist Church in Michigan and pretty good sized church. I'm, I'm doing everything. And 
Richard Phillips had just retired from his church that he pastor for 40 years in Montrose, and he came and became a member of the church. And he was my exhorter. He was my father in the faith. I mean, he was my amen section, and he would just encourage me and help me. Uh, and uh, he tried to get me every way he could to stay there. Uh, you know, he said, I'll give you my library if you take, take the pastor there and turn down a library, you know, and everything else. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, he would say this, he was a Jewish man, and he actually fought in the Israeli army. You can, even if you're anywhere in the world and you have Jewish blood, you can go uh, and join the, um, the military there in Israel. So he put his two years of service there in Israel, had great stories from when he was in service. Now he was in his 70s at this time uh, over there. And he said, uh, you know in the Psalms, you know why it says the God of Jacob instead of the God of Israel, Jacob's new name? Uh, he says, you know, if you said the God of Abraham, Abraham is such an esteemed character, this great man of faith. And then also Israel, a prince with God uh, that uh, wrestled with God and won. But if I can say the God of Jacob, I can identify with Jacob because I can say I, I am a heel catching, surplanting, deceiving man, but you are my God. Uh, and so here in Hosea chapter 12, uh, Israel is encouraged to follow the footsteps of their father Jacob. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 12. He, Jacob, well look at two. Look at verse 2. So, the Lord hath also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel, and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Even the Lord of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment, and notice this, and wait on thy God continually. He said, be like Jacob, Judah. He says, go look at your father and look at the relationship that he had with the Lord, and do thou likewise. And here he points to this wrestling match that Jacob had uh, there at this crisis point in the life. Now Israel was in a crisis point there in Judah, and they're about to be brought into captivity. And, and let's say that Babylon, Esau, is right at the gate. And he says, if you would just turn to the Lord in the same fashion Jacob did, trust me, Jacob, man, he was, he was, a, he was trouble from even before he was born. But yet he got one thing right in his life, is that he wrestled with God in prayer. Here's three lessons from this wrestling match. Uh, back in our text there in chapter 32, uh, verse number 24, we see the first thing that Jacob did right is that he did not let go of God. Verse number 24, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him unto the breaking of the day. So Jacob was in the biggest fight of his life. And we realize here in this story that the real wrestling match in our life is not with people. So he had his dysfunctional family, uh, his mother, his father, his brother, uh, Laban, his wife, uh, the predicament that he was currently in and all these, all these things. His wrestling match wasn't with people, it was with God. Uh, his wrestling match wasn't with his circumstances either. It was with God. Uh, his wrestling match uh, was between his soul and his soul's maker. We're going to see Jacob coming out of this wrestling match weaker than he was before. Man, don't you hate physical weakness? I mean, I do. That's why I work out. But no, I like feeling good. Um, I, I know when I get a a cold, I feel like I lost my salvation. I don't know about you. But he's going to come out and his hamstring, he's going to be hamstrung. He's going to be limp, limping and leaning on his staff. And guess what he's going to do? Calmly and with, his, with peace, supernatural peace, is he's going to go straight to his brother Esau and he's going to go there with strength, which proves the whole situation of his life 
was that it was just a big relationship between his own soul and his Savior, between him and his God. And so we see here that um, in verse number 25, it says, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, so there's a man wrestling with him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And so here Jacob did not go until the day broke, until they saw the daylight. Luke 24, 28 and 29. Uh, Jesus on the road to Emmaus says, They drew nigh to the village, whither they went, and made, and he, Jesus, made as though he would have gone on further but they constrained him. They said, we're not letting you go. They don't even know this is Christ. I think spiritually and instinctively, they knew this was Christ. Uh, but in their own mind and in their own hearts, they did not know it was Christ. They said, you were going to stay here. There's an illustration of perseverance in the Bible. Uh, and it's given again and again and again. Remember, Elijah was a man subject unto like passions such as we are. But yet he prayed fervently that it should not rain. What was the difference between you and I and Elijah? Uh, Elijah prayed fervently. Jesus gave three different uh, parables about persistence in prayer. Uh, one was the parable of the unjust judge. You remember the woman came and cried before the judge day after day after day. And though he was an unjust judge, he said, I don't fear God and I don't fear man. He says, yet but because of her importunity, she can have what she's asking. Uh, and then, then there's the parable that Jesus gives of the unfriendly neighbor. He says, you know, that neighbor comes and knocks on your door at midnight. I need some food to give my company. I need some food. Uh, let me tell you something is that what you need in your life uh, is something that only God can give you. Uh, and so the illustration of there is us banging and us going to God and persistently praying to the Lord. Uh, there's also the illustration of the unnatural father. You know, Luke chapter number 11. Uh, what father, you being evil, give good gifts to your children? Uh, what father, when uh, the children ask for bread, you give them a stone or you give them a serpent or a scorpion? Uh, he says that you being evil, give good things to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good things to them that ask. And this is Jacob, is that he is going to persist in prayer. I will not let you go until you bless me. So don't let go until the day breaks. Don't let go when it hurts. So Jacob here is in personal pain. Hamstring injury, the biggest muscle on your body, it can cause the most amount of pain. And Jacob realized, despite my hurt, I'm going to hold on to God. Don't let go in an area of your life is out of joint. Notice um, in a wrestling match or in a boxing match, uh, when, when a guy gets clocked, boom, and he starts seeing stars. You know what he does? He goes and he grabs onto his opponent. He gets in closer. And uh, when any area of your life is out of joint, when any area of your life is hurt, then is the time to get closer to the Lord. It's not the time to drift away from the Lord. It's the time to lean in. I will not let you go. A marriage, a job, a health situation, any trial, don't let go when an area of your life is out of joint. Secondly, don't let go of God. Don't lie to God. Verse number 28. So God asks, what is thy name? Uh, Jacob's going to ask God the same question. Okay. And uh, why do you ask my name? Uh, and, and name, especially in this day, had to do with nature. Remember that Moses meant drawn out of the water. Jacob means surplanter. His name is going to be changed to Israel, a prince with God who has prevailed with God. Uh, and so, he, so um, now the secret things belong to the Lord, right? And so in this particular moment, God said, I'm not going to tell you my name. He wants to know more, know more about this, this nature. And for whatever reason, I don't know why. 
some scholar will have some answer somewhere that they made up or whatever. Uh, but I don't think, that, I think it's all speculation. God says, what are you asking me my name for? You don't need to know my name. You don't need to know the why behind what's going on here. Uh, but God asked Jacob the same question that he asked God. What is your name? You think God didn't know Jacob's name? You know what he's getting Jacob to do? He's getting him to confess his nature. So he says, my name is heel, sir, heel catching surplanter. My name is liar deceiver. That is what my name is and that is what my nature is. And, uh, and so you can't lie to God. You can lie to everybody else. We can put a good face on. I can put my pastor face on and you can put your parishioner face on and we can hold our head up high like we have a halo around our head. Uh, but we cannot lie to God. Be honest. So Jacob, stop blaming your dad. Stop blaming your mom. Stop blaming your uncle. Stop blaming your wife, the pretty one and the ugly one. Stop blaming people in your life and stand on your own two feet. I was talking to um, my friend Robbie Gassman who I grew up with. He dropped in for service here a couple weeks ago, retired Air Force. And now it's weird when I have somebody my age is 100% retired. But good for him. I will be retired when I throw dirt on my face. That's when I'm going to plan on retiring. And I'll, I'll pass on my debt to my children, you know, like all good fathers. And, uh, but anyway, so we were talking about, now we grew up in Christian circles. And, uh, and we are talking about a few of the people... People, you know, every child is looking for the real world. And there's a lot of people. It's funny because you can take somebody um, from a bad circumstance in a bad situation and they're just as sweet as pie and they wouldn't complain for one minute. But, you know, you start talking to them in casual conversation about their childhood and their childhood was terrible. And you think, wow, and they don't even complain about it. Then I know kids who like, you know, Grandma didn't put enough chocolate chips in my cookies. You know, um, you know all he got on Christmas was, you know, a BB gun and a this and a th and, and then, the, you know, so we all have those fronts. Jacob, at this point in his life, it could be blame, 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 or bitterness, bitterness, bitterness. But instead, he stands on his own two feet, and he admits to the Lord what his nature is. Lord, I am a deceiver. We shouldn't lie to God about ourselves. Who are you? That's what God wants to know. We have these big egos. We have these big facades that we build up and we start believing the lie yep. of our own facade. Yep. We really do. And a lot of times we're put in a predicament where we have to get alone and start peeling back the layers and start admitting to God who we really are, transparent. I think of what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You can't see God when you're lying to yourself and God about who you really are. We have to be honest before God can make us what we need to be. When he says, my name is Deceiver, he says, your name will no longer be deceiver, but prince with God. You have prevailed. And really, the essence here is that he wrestled God until God won. And that's really the secret of any good prayer meeting, is that you wrestle with God until God changes you. Most times, in most situations, when we really get serious with God... Um, and we know God can change the circle. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to pray till God changes things. And then we go there and we pray and we pray and pray. And God doesn't change things. Guess who he changes? Us. And that's exactly what God does in that cir circumstance is he changes Jacob so he can face his brother Esau. To receive a new name in the Bible is to receive a new beginning. Guess how old Jacob is here? 96. You're not too old for a new beginning. Abram, Abraham, old man when he received his new name 
which was a characteristic of his new nature. Simon, his name was changed to Peter, Saul to Paul, Sarai, I think that's how you say it, to Sarah, the mother of many nations. It is by God's strength we go to heaven. It is by God's strength we can be what he intended for us to be. Last lesson from this wrestling match. Don't let your limp get in the way. Notice um, here in, in verse number 28 again, we'll read down through verse number 32. It says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. And Peniel there means seeing God's face. I have met with God. There's no better feeling in the world uh, to have gone into the prayer closet and know uh, that you had God on the line. <laughs> there's nothing else. And let me say this. There's nothing else you need in this life. It's to know that God is with you and that you're dialed in to God. I have seen God face to face and, and my life is preserved. My life is in the Lord's hands. He's got a peaceful, easy feeling from this point forth. I mean, he knows that his life is in God's hand. He has heard from God. And notice in verse number uh, 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him. Here is, here is the picturesque uh, verse here. The sun is shining on me. The sun is shining on his shoulder. And, he, and the sun rose upon him, and notice this, and he halted on his thigh. All we need is a vision of God. Think of, uh, you know, I was going, well, the Josh got accepted there in a crown college, and uh, Clarence Sexton has, his like a father-like presentation every time he preaches. He says certain things over and over again. And he repeats himself on purpose. I mean, there's uh, probably, you know, someone gone, gone there for, for four years, they can say about 50 different things that he says continuously. And, uh, and he'll say this continuously, as you and I will only go as far as our vision of God. Again and again, everything in the Christian life has to do with our vision of God. I have seen God. He says, I have been preserved I'm still alive, and God is not finished with me yet at 96 years old. And then another thing about Jacob is that he limps along on his journey. The sun rose on him. Paul said this, I will glory in my infirmities. You know another verse that we ought to remember? No flesh shall glory in my presence. You notice any of the people that God has used in the Bible, we could list off their faults, save a few. Daniel, Joseph, you know, for whatever reason, these men, there is no taint, you know, in their record, there's nothing that's spotted. Uh, there, there's no, uh, but everybody else in scripture, I mean, they have their limps. You know, I always, I always worry about a guy if he gets up for the styles and starts, you know, he's the hero of every story. I think, whoa. That's why I try to preach the Bible. I, you know, the, the reverse of it, this guy gets up. You don't, you, let me tell you how terrible I am. Well, let's not talk about you at all. Let's talk about the Lord. But, uh, but man, you start bragging or start uh, preaching about yourself, man, you are about ready for trouble. Because all idols have clay feet. All idols are going to fall. And, uh, and God said, no flesh shall glory in my presence. So you know how you and I are going to make it to glory, make it to heaven? We're going to go in limping. With all our faults, with all our foibles, with all of our failures, that we're going to go in leaning on our staff. And I want you to notice something, is that the children of Israel, when they don't eat the sinew, uh, they're actually celebrating Jacob's weakness. Let me tell you something about you tonight. 
whatever your strength is and whatever you pride yourself in as you're really good at X, Y, and Z is actually your weakness. And your weakness is actually your strength. Whatever area of your life you say, oh, I need God in this area. I need to lean on my staff. I heard a, a black preacher at a camp meeting one time, and, man, they are far more articulate and rhythmic and everything else. Uh, what? Brother Sex, next week, you know. I mean, this guy, this guy was, I mean, he was shelling out the corn. I mean, he was, bring, and I remember he preached from Hebrews chapter number 11, and Jacob leaned on his staff. And Jacob leaned on his staff. And he's talking about the staff that Jacob leaned on. Uh, and let me tell you something. Again, your weakness, your hamstring that's out of order, whatever that is, you know, former track record, former this, former that, former the other, your health situation, whatever it is that brings you to your knees is actually going to be your strength. And look at again there, verse number 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted on his thigh. Uh, the greatness of you is going to be your weakness. The greatness of our church as well is also going to be in our weakness. We need to be a church. This is we need God's strength. We need to lean on Him. We need to come together and wrestle with God. We need to come together and pray. Woe is me. My biggest fear in the whole world is that... Uh, People would say, you know that pastor over there, he's just he's got so much charisma and he's so handsome. It's not funny. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that, uh, man, he's just, boy, man, if you're, you know, if, if this church is ever leaning on me, boy, it should be, man, you know, our, our pastor, boy, we need to pray. You know, our church members, boy, we need, to, we need prayer. We are a bunch of Jacobs here. And we need to lean on God heavily. Let me read a few things to you. Paul said, I would rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Again, whatever the hamstring is in your life, whatever the issue is, uh, whatever your infirmity is, whatever your uh, weakness is in your life, that's actually your strength. That's actually your strength. You know, whatever, you know, people talking, uh, you know, about you and think, oh, they're picking me apart about this or about that. Or about You know what that is? That's your strength. It's not your weakness. Your weakness is your strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Paul says this, And he, Jesus, said unto to me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. He says, in reproaches, in necessity. So I take pleasures in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And this is the story all throughout Scripture. Moses had a dysfunctional family. Timothy had an ulcer. He was a worrier. Paul had his thorn. Hosea had a prostitute wife. Rahab was known, Old Testament and New Testament, as the harlot. Jeremiah was put in a pit. John was boiled in oil. Stephen was stoned to death. Jesus was crucified for our sin. And the sun rose again on the third day. And remember, before he went to the cross, there was a wrestling match in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Lord was given strength there. It says in Hebrews 11:21, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on his staff. And we see there verse number 32. Therefore, the children of Israel... You know, they could look, they're going to look to Jacob, and they're going to look at, to a, a man who was far from perfect, but he did one thing right in his life. All the blessings of Jacob can't be attributed to Jacob. All, all the power of Jacob can't be attributed to Jacob. What they're going to celebrate is Jacob's weakness, and here it says in verse 32, Therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because 
he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. So our admonition, our lessons from this wrestling match are don't let go of God. Don't let go until you see the light. Don't let go through pain. Don't, let, don't lie to God. Be honest. What is your name? What is your name? Be honest with God about your character. Number three, don't let your limp get in the way. Serve God with your limp. And someday through the gates of glory, just like Jacob, we're all going to go limping through those gates. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Genesis 32. And Lord, we thank you for just your honesty about the saints in the word of God each and every one of us can say the God of Jacob is our God we can identify with Jacob tonight and Lord I pray that you'd help us to learn from our spiritual forefather uh, Lord I pray that you'd help us to make those appointments with you those those wrestling matches where it's our soul with God and Lord I pray that you'd help us in Jesus name Amen. Let's all stand. We'll have a hymn. I want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time. I want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.